tens of thousands gather for the Pope's final public appearance. One dead in a rare shark attack at a New Zealand surf beach. A fire tears through a Kolkata market, killing at least 18. And China's most prominent scholars call for political reform. Good evening. You're watching ABC News for Australian Network. I'm Della Rani. Pope Benedict has made an emotional farewell at his last general audience, saying he understood the gravity of his decision to become the first pontiff to resign in 700 years. He told the massive crowd in St. Peter's Square that despite renouncing his office, he would remain in the service of the church through prayer. Europe's correspondent Mary Geerant was there for the service. The Pope has just finished his last address to the public of his papacy before he resigns. Many thousands have gathered here uh, at St Peter's Square and down the street outside the Vatican to express their support for the Pope. Uh, many are faithful, some are curious. He drove among cheering crowds and then addressed in several languages the people who are gathered here. He said that he would be devoting the rest of his life to the cross he resigns officially tomorrow. So the decision I have made after much prayer is the fruit of a serene trust in God's will, the deep love of Christ's church. I will continue to accompany the church with my prayers and ask each of you to pray for me and for the new Pope. He'll be saying goodbye to the cardinals behind closed doors and then he'll be flying off to his papal residence just outside Rome where he'll be for a couple of months and where he will officially resign. In New Zealand, a shark has killed a man in a rare attack at a popular surf beach north of Auckland. Witnesses say the 47-year-old was swimming 200 metres offshore when the shark pulled him underwater. Police responded by shooting at the shark from a helicopter and a boat. Our correspondent Governor Schwartz reports from Murawai Beach. This is believed to be the killer shark just minutes after his deadly attack on a local swimmer. He just yelled out, shark! And next minute we saw him like rolling around, there was blood everywhere on the water. The married man in his 40s was swimming about 200 metres off Muawai Beach. He was known to the surf life club that tried to save him. My team uh, discovered the body, discovered the sharks were still there. Uh, it was a case of standing off for a while, we needed to put a bit of a plan in place. By the time life-saving boats and the rescue helicopter reached the man, he was dead. Two sharks were circling. Police took aim at the killer animal. He has discharged his firearm towards the shark. We do not know at this stage whether or not he has hit the shark, but the shark rolled off and uh, disappeared. It's likely the three to four metre shark is a great white. I think it's most likely to be a white shark in this instance. Um, in reality, the only sharks around New Zealand that ever really take on prey items, as big as a person, would be a great white. The man's body was returned to distraught family members who gathered at the surf club. Shark attacks are rare in New Zealand. According to international records, there have been only 48 known attacks, and of those, eight were fatal. That toll has tragically risen and authorities don't want to add further to it. Auckland's West Coast beaches will be closed for at least two days while aerial and beach patrols search for the killer animal. Dominic Schwartz, ABC News, Murawai Beach, Auckland. A Guam man who allegedly killed three Japanese tourists and injured 11 others in a frenzied knife attack has pleaded not guilty on the grounds of mental illness. Chad Ryan DeSoto was arrested earlier this month after ploughing his car into a tourist resort in Guam and going on a stabbing spree. He has pleaded not guilty to charges of murder, attempted murder and use of a deadly weapon. The judge has ordered DeSoto to undergo a psychological evaluation. At least three people have been shot dead by a gunman who opened fire at a factory in central Switzerland. Swiss media is reporting another seven people were wounded at the wood panel plant in the town of Mentnau. Seventeen people, including 11 police officers, have been killed in an attack by insurgents on a police post in Afghanistan. The Taliban says they carried out the attack in the central eastern province of Ghazni. Local officials say the victims were poisoned and then shot. At least 18 people have been killed in a fire that swept through an illegal market in the Indian city of Kolkata. 
Nearly 40 others were injured and hundreds of firefighters were needed to bring the fire under control. The blaze began at around 3 in the morning with dozens of people asleep inside the six-storey building. It took a huge team of firefighters more than three hours to bring it under control. Our main priority is to rescue those trapped inside the building and provide proper treatment to the injured. Fire crews smashed windows to get to people trapped in the building. The unlicensed shops of the Surya Sand Market stocked plastics, paper and foam, creating thick black smoke which hampered rescuers and contributed to the high death toll. Firefighters have reported finding dozens of people unconscious on the upper floors, many of them with severe burns. They say several suffocated in their sleep. Others lost everything as homes and offices went up in flames. My entire office on the first floor has been burnt. All my files and all my accounts have been burnt. It's not the first major fire in Kolkata in recent years. In 2011, nearly 90 people died when a blaze ripped through a seven-storey hospital. Authorities aren't sure what caused the fire, but the poorly maintained buildings in the former British colonial capital are notorious for old and faulty wiring. The state government has announced an investigation and will provide compensation for victims' families. Timothy Pope, ABC News. In Western Australia, severe tropical cyclone Rusty is likely to make landfall along the Pilbara coast latest night. It's now thought the town of Port Hedland will be spared the worst. Jake Stoner reports from Port Hedland. Residents have been in lockdown for more than 30 hours and it appears the threat from severe tropical cyclone Rusty has eased. It's now tracking directly towards Pardu Station, about 120 kilometres east of here. So far, there's only been reports of minor damage and the community is feeling a sense of relief. While the imminent threat of destructive wind gusts may have passed, there's still a high chance of flooding. The system could dump 600 millimetres of rain on the town, about as much as Perth would receive in an entire winter. Already we've seen significant rainfall. Rainfall totals this morning were up around 180 millimetres in places and we do expect to see further heavy rainfall, of course, as the system moves south. And our switch now would be from structural damage into the possibility of flooding, widespread flooding through the catchment areas, depending if it's uh, to the west or to the east of the main catchment. Authorities say the red alert will remain in place until the severe tropical cyclone is heading inland and weakening. You're watching ABC News for Australia Network. Coming up in the bulletin, a nil-all draw for Australia's Central Coast and the Asian Champions League. And the spin doctor to the rescue, Australia calls on expert help. <laughs> For the second time in three months, some of China's most prominent scholars, journalists and activists have released an open letter urging leaders to implement political reforms. More than 100 people signed the open letter urging Chinese leaders to ratify an international human rights treaty. It comes as new Communist Party leader Xi Jinping is set to be officially installed as China's president. And that'll happen in just a few days when Beijing will be flooded with more than 2,000 party officials for the country's annual political gathering. The event that also marks the end of the rare leadership transition is taking place amid a major anti-corruption drive in the country. China correspondent Hui Fan Tei reports from Beijing. Zhang Bingjian is a filmmaker whose taste for black comedy extends to art. The walls in his office are adorned with commissioned portraits of Chinese officials who have been convicted of corruption. These are just a select few of the 1,600 he's amassed. Each one is the same color as the largest denomination of the Chinese currency, the 100 yuan. Their size is the same as authorized portraits of Chinese officials. I don't care, okay. I don't care how senior the government official is. So long as the money you've taken is taxpayers' money, then it's wrong. There's certainly no shortage of potential material for Zhang Bingjian. Dozens of junior officials and their allies have been exposed and expelled from the party over the past three months. Details of sex, power and money have flooded the Chinese press. The naming and shaming is part of a cleaner, more open, more frugal society that Xi Jinping wants to create in China. 
because incidents of official largesse and excess are making locals cease his anger. They want more accountability, and you only have to go online to hear the loud chorus of voices. China's own central bank estimates $123 billion has been lost to corruption since the mid-90s. Xi Jinping fears if the problem isn't tackled, it could spell the collapse of the party and the nation. But observers say the extent of reform will be hampered by the lack of an independent judiciary. Even our government officials are not being effectively monitored. We are dependent on the discipline commission and a detention system that's unique to the Communist Party. They are not subjected to scrutiny by a third party. There are still plenty of sensitivity surrounding political commentary, which is why Zhang Pingjian chooses not to say anything when asked if there will be a portrait of disgraced politician Bo Xi Lai if he is charged and convicted of corruption. Wei Fun Tei, ABC News, Beijing. A court in the U.S. has labelled conservationist group Sea Shepherd as pirates. Despite fierce criticism from Australia and New Zealand, Japan's new fisheries minister says his country will never abandon whale hunting. His comments come as protest boats and the whaling fleet confront each other in Australia's Antarctic waters. As Sea Shepherd and the whalers slug it out in the Southern Ocean, Japan's fisheries minister says his country will never stop hunting the mammals. Yoshimasa Hayashi, who took over the ministry in December, says criticism of the practice amounts to a cultural attack and prejudice against Japanese culture. He points out there is a long historical tradition about whaling. The fisheries minister says Japan is an island nation, so taking protein from the ocean is very important for food security. He says that in Korea they eat dogs, in Australia they eat kangaroos, but the Japanese don't eat those animals. Japan wants the Australian and New Zealand governments to restrain Sea Shepherd from what it says are criminal actions. These are very dangerous and treacherous waters. We can't provide immediate support when something goes terribly wrong there, and we think full heads should prevail. Criticism of Sea Shepherd has also come from the United States Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which has already ordered the protesters to keep their distance from the whalers. A ruling from the court says you don't need a peg leg or an eye patch. When you ram ships, you are without doubt a pirate, no matter how high-minded you believe your purpose to be. This is not Japan saying this. This is not the ICR that's been saying this. This is a very senior court in the United States calling, these, uh, uh, calling this group uh, pirates and, and saying that they're breaking three international conventions. Sea Shepherd wants the Australian Navy swung into action. With the whaling season due to end in a fortnight, the conflict shows no signs of ebbing away. Gabby Hills, ABC News. Fiji's former governing party, the SDL, is confident it will be registered as an official opposition party after conforming with tough new rules imposed by the military government. The group has more than 5,000 financial members and has also changed its name to SoDelta, which stands for the Social Democratic Liberal Party. Under the political party's decree, SoDelta was not allowed to keep its original Fiji name and then, after a further amendment, unable to use the initials SDL. That's what people are saying, uh, that you be targeted, and we feel like that as well. But uh, we are following the decree. Uh, to the letter to make sure that we will be registered. And I believe that in the names that we've chosen and in the abbreviations that we have chosen for the proposed party, uh, we will be able to succeed. Sadalpa, as well as other political parties in Fiji, are backing a legal challenge to have the political party decree struck down. Takaki Giant Apple has offered to compensate parents whose children racked up credit card debts while playing games downloaded on iTunes. Five American parents sued Apple, arguing they failed to adequately disclose that free game apps targeting children contain the ability to make in-app purchases. Apple says the settlement could cost the company up to $100 million. 
A French warship has said bonjour to Darwin as part of a joint training exercise with the Royal Australian Navy. Dozens of sailors from the French Navy are getting a taste of the top end before deploying to Southeast Asia. Richard Brennan reports. The French frigate Vendemier has arrived in Australian waters, bringing with it 96 sailors who conduct exercises with the Navy in the Northern Territory. I'm sure the Australian Navy has to teach us a few things, and maybe uh, we can say something to them too. The combat ship is normally based in New Caledonia. It's about to spend four months sailing to Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, China and Japan. The Australian Navy says France is an important ally in the Pacific. The, the protocols at sea are very similar regardless of which navy you're in. And so we talk the same language and, and essentially have the same goals. But the cuisine on board is a little more gourmet than Australian fare. Naturally, there are freshly baked baguettes and even one made especially for Darwin. Some of the crew have spent two years in the Pacific on the Vendemiaire. One of the luckiest men of the world because uh, very few people in the world uh, have the luck to see so many countries. The crew will be here for five days resting and training before deploying to Southeast Asia. But before then they have some sightseeing to do. Australian football because there is a match on Sunday I guess. Uh, I will be discovering the museums uh, and maybe a last going to a few pubs. They'll say bon voyage to the top end next week. Bridget Brennan, ABC News, Darwin. <laughs> The United States is facing another economic cliffhanger with deep budget cuts due to kick in later this week. Democrats say it will be a disaster and even the country's chief banker says the cuts will hurt the struggling economy. But as Lisa Miller reports, others aren't so sure. From hospitals to schools to mental health services, hiring is on hold, projects have been delayed and the future looks uncertain. If those shrink at any level, and they should shrink, all three should shrink, then we can look at less money to fund services for children with mental health issues. All federal departments have been told they'll wear the pain of $85 billion in cuts between now and September. The president's warned even food inspectors could be sent on forced leave. And the impact of this policy won't be felt overnight, but it will be real. Congress couldn't agree on how to tackle the country's deficit, so these automatic cuts to discretionary spending begin this weekend. They're a self-inflicted wound that doesn't have to happen. The country's top banker is also worried at predictions 750,000 jobs could be lost. They can find a better combination, obviously it would be uh, better for, uh, for our economy. Well, ben Bernanke wants to see some last minute compromise. Again, I hope that Congress can work together effectively to address these issues with a minimum of uncertainty because the uncertainty itself, of course, is also um, costly. But some Republicans say the cuts are needed and there's nothing draconian about them. I just have to strongly disagree with the notion that we have some kind of severe austerity program that's about to kick in. The rhetoric is intensifying and there's no sign of compromise. Democrats think higher taxes should be part of the solution. Republicans are ruling that out. Lisa Miller, ABC News, Washington. To finance now, the Australian share market rallied today. In contrast to European markets, which fell sharply in reaction to the political stalemate in Italy, here's Alan Kohler. Well, share market is actually looking quite resilient in the face of a near unanimous view among the bottoms that it had run a bit too far and the appearance of renewed euro jitters. Miners, banks, industrials and retailers all did pretty well and the biggest fall among the leaders was UGL because of a disappointing profit result. As expected, stocks on the Milan Borsa took a hammering after the uncertain outcome of the Italian election. But they've had more than 60 governments in 60 years, so I'm not sure what the market expected there. Anyway, all European markets were sold down, but Wall Street scored a rise because Federal Reserve Chairman Ben Bernanke gave his semi-annual congressional testimony and reassured everyone that he's not going to pull the quantitative easing rug from under the market until there's evidence of a sustained recovery in the economy. Gold was another beneficiary of the Fed Chairman's testimony, rising back above $1,600 an ounce. Other metals were more subdued but still went up and oil went down. 
The Australian dollar eased back again today, perhaps weighed down by a warning from Standard & Poor's that Australia could lose its AAA credit rating. Manufacturers can only hope. Meanwhile, the construction business finished 2012 on a flat note, with a slight fall in work in the December quarter. The big year-on-year -year rise in private construction was offset by a fall in public works. And the charts tell us there was a bubble and bust in public works in Australia in response to the GFC. And presumably it'll be cut back even more now as governments try to get their budgets back under control. But really that wasn't a bubble. This is a bubble. Private sector infrastructure. Basically the resources boom and mostly in Queensland and Western Australia. And this one hasn't burst yet. That's finance. To sport now, and Australia's Central Coast Mariners and South Korea Suwon Blue Wings have played out a scoreless draw in their opening Asian Champions League match. The Mariners were handed the chance to take all three points late in the game. Oh, oh, oh. Thank you to the But Nick Montgomery couldn't deliver the goods. Meanwhile, Newcastle has consolidated its position in the A-League's top six, thanks to a 2-1 win over Wellington. Adam Taggart struck first, then Michael Bridges' three to double Jeff's lead. Jeremy Brocky scored a late consolation for the last place to Phoenix. The Australian cricket team is trying to find answers on how to cope with India's spinners before the second test starts in Hyderabad on Saturday. After a heavy loss in the series opener, the tourists are considering boosting their own spinning stocks. Duncan Hunsdale reports. Australia was served up 193 overs of spin at Chennai and lost all 20 wickets to the slow bowlers. And there's no hiding from the fact that we're going to have to work out how to play spin and work out work that out very quickly ahead in the next test match. But um, oh, play better against spin. Help arrived in the form of the spin doctor Shane Warne, who's prescribing an increased dose of Australian spin for the second test. Three quick plus on Rikers is not the answer. They have to go with what they've got. And if the best spinning option they've got is Dowdy to add the line, then they should do that. In hindsight, you could say maybe two spinners. Um, but yet our quick bowler took fast to 90. Shane Warne says spinning all-rounder Glenn Maxwell should also be considered and spoke at length to Lyon and the Australian Brains Trust about giving the Indians some of their own medicine. Michael Clark says the blame doesn't rest with those who pick the team. It's not just about selection, it's about how you perform. Australia's top four failed to fire, but the captain looks set to stay at five. I don't know how moving up the order guarantees any more runs. The home team expects the tourists to improve. They are a very good batting lineup. you know, they are aggressive. And as the series progresses, you know, I think they'll bad run. But that's only half the battle, as Australia attempts to break the spin cycle and turn the series around. Duncan Hunstow, ABC News. He's shown he's got what it takes on two wheels. Now, Casey Stoner is about to launch his career behind the wheel of a V8 supercar. The former Motor GP champion has teamed up with some of the best drivers in the business as he prepares for his first race in the V8 Development Series this weekend in Adelaide. Mark Hyde reports. It's a world far removed from MotoGP, but Casey Stoner is determined to excel behind the wheel of a V8. He's had just two testing days ahead of his debut race. You know, we're planning to take a year off and, uh, and get away from everything. Um, but, you know, the real world, you know, you can't just sort of um, disappear and expect to, uh, to come back into racing on your own. The move from a bike to a car is a balancing act for Sona and his crew. Well, there's some things that translate into four wheels. Uh, I guess, you know, just general uh, feeling with the tyre and the tarmac. mate. Uh, although, you know, I don't get to, to change my body position to, to adapt to things. His record goes before him and it actually takes an awful moment of courage that someone, someone changed his spin from two to four. Jamie Wincup and Craig Lowndes drive for Triple Eight in the Supercar Series and they're confident that new teammates can succeed. The couple of times that we've had him in the car, he, he's equaled our time. So, uh, you know, he, as I said, his ability to adapt and understand the car has been sensational. He's just like someone who can run 100 metres, you know, if they put their mind to it, they can run 400 pretty well. So that expects a less painful learning curve than he confronted in MotoGP. If you like the front wheels of these, you know, you can sort of run wide, but it's not going to be uh, anywhere near as bad as what can happen on a bike. At just 27, he has plenty of time to push for a drive in the V8 supercars.
it's not really a time frame, it's just, you know, how competitive you are, how, uh, you know, how the progression is, and uh, also if you deserve it. His attention to detail has already impressed his team. Mark Hyde, ABC News. And finally, a Japanese great-grandmother has been officially recognised as the oldest woman in the world. 114-year-old Misao Okawa was born in 1898 and she will turn 115 next week. Japan has more than 51,000 people aged over 100. For those wanting to reach a ripe old age, Mrs Okawa has the following advice. Look out for your health. You're watching ABC News for Australia Network. Before we go, let's take another look at the headlines. Tens of thousands have packed St Peter's Square to bid farewell to Pope Benedict the 16th. A swimmer is killed in a rare shark attack at a popular New Zealand surf beach. And some of China's most prominent scholars again call on leaders to implement political reform. And that's all for this bulletin. For more news and current affairs from the region, you can visit our website. And if you want to keep updated on breaking news, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also use the Australia Network app on your phone. It has the latest concert alerts for travellers and information about all the Australia Network programs. For more of the team here, thanks for your company. I'm Della Rani. Have a great night.